the sweet smoke of incense rising like the piety of prayers to consecrate a new cathedral. So may the love of Christ fill your church. The Victorian church the new cathedral replaces is a building adorned with the furnishings of an ecclesiastical museum, traditional and dark, familiar and comforting. The pro-cathedral for the diocese for 123 years, the parish church in Park Place, Clifton. Now its wooden pillars are crumbling and it begins to sink in everything but affectionate esteem. It's a church which has a lot of um, personal memories for most people and I don't think it will ever be replaced and that's why I'm very glad that the new cathedral is so vastly different, because we just won't compare them. Well, it's had a, um, an atmosphere which has been very useful at times. Uh, physically, it's not the most attractive buildings. That isn't um, necessary, of course, but it's, uh, it's, it's a slight point against it. Well, I think it captures the spirit of a church a lot more than the new one will. But, uh, you know, to me, a church is a church. I feel that the place is not so important as the people, it's the people that make the church. in March 1970 to build the new cathedral. It was to accommodate a thousand people and cost only 600,000 pounds. It had to be both parish church and cathedral. It had to last at least 300 years. It also had to meet the requirements of new forms of worship laid down by the Second Vatican Council. These were the exacting guidelines facing the project architect, Ronald Weeks. Our early discussions with the church on briefing allowed us to ask very simple questions and to record the requirements of the church in simple diagrams which we've translated into the building. The church required a high altar, a position for the bishop, the cathedra, and an arrangement whereby the priests on the sanctuary and the people in the nave could be seen 
to be participating in the Mass. To these main parts of the church was added a weekday chapel, a place for the pulpit, and a font. The font, instead of being in the traditional place at the back of the church, is here towards the front where the people can participate in the baptismal service. People enter the church from Pembroke Road, from Clifton Park, they meet at the font, renew their baptismal vows, and then proceed into their seats. The procession into the new cathedral for the ceremony of consecration. Among the congregation, Cardinal Heenan, Archbishop of Westminster, many bishops and priests, Bristol City dignitaries, and more than a thousand guests from the diocese, which covers Wiltshire, Somerset, Gloucestershire, and the new county, Avon. The day is a feast day of the apostles Peter and Paul, June the 29th, 1973, and the cathedral is dedicated to the two saints the seventh Bishop of Clifton, Dr. Joseph Rudderham. The main doors, a gift of the city and embellished with Bristol's coat of arms, open upon a building which symbolizes a new relationship between priests and parishioners. tie this arrangement together needed some form of order. The one that slotted into place most easily was to adopt the hexagon and the altar on a hexagonal sanctuary with the people arranged around it, cathedra, priests, blessed sacrament chapel and font, encased in a hexagonal shape was the basis for the design. Having reached this stage, we took the further steps by going into a model form to control and to explain to the client. And it's this model which we've used to take us through every approval stage with the client. <laughs> the congregation find their way to the nave seating via the ambulatory or walkway at the back and the arrangement of the nave is here so that all the people are in close contact with the sanctuary. The furthest row is 45 to 50 feet from the front of the sanctuary. This realized one of the requirements, the main requirement in fact, of the church. They had been talking of church renewal and alteration and they wanted the people to be in as close as proximity as possible to the high altar so that they may actively participate in the celebration of the Mass. <laughs> The concrete cathedral where engaged knights come up automatically over the confessionals 
owes nothing to the Gothic architecture of the past. The structural simplicity speaks for itself. Even at the Stations of the Cross, conventional religious art has given way to the dramatic cement sculptures of William Mitchell. The material is a, is a new media, really, called fair creep. It's concrete, but it doesn't fall to the ground like a lot of jelly when you, when you mix it up, you see. But the only thing about it is that when you put it in a mould, it's wet, and you've only got about an hour and a half to, to work on it. So you have to be very quick. And the image you have in your mind has to be quite clear. You've got to remember that a lot of these stations, in fact, are, are new as far as the general idea of the stations of the course are concerned. So they're upset about that to begin with. Then probably the media is a bit hairy, but then so was the experience. Pastor and priest takes his seat for the first time. Dr. Rudderham, 74, and Bishop of Clifton since 1949. The bishop is the center of that part of the church which is confided to his care. And he has to have a place where he can be seen and where he can officiate as that. And that's what the cathedral is for. We have tried to express this importance of the building in terms of the volume of the spaces inside. The nave slopes from 30 feet at the back to 54 feet at the front of the sanctuary steps, rising in height and increasing in intensity of natural light, culminating with the cupola arranged over the sanctuary and the high altar the lines of the structure being carried up to form the flesh. Compromisingly modern, the cathedral has only two stained glass windows. They illuminate the entrance hall and the nearby font. Elsewhere, windows at eye level have been avoided, as they were thought distracting. Instead, there are roof lights, and the building is designed so that the intensity of light increases towards the high altar. The effect is dramatic and untraditional. For the clerk of works, Ken Murray, so is the building. When I started at first, I thought the church was far too geometrical, and I never thought it would ever be a church. But there were a few moments of truth in the building of the cathedral. For example, when the shuttering was removed from the nave and the hexagonal apertures in the star beam were revealed, this gave it a majesty, I would say. I wouldn't say uh, 
a church form, but it did give it a character. And as the other parts of the church have been revealed, I am I I like it very much. It's a primarily been a concrete job. But when I say concrete, it's good concrete, good class form work. I doubt if you'll see anything better than this. And that's not bragging. <laughs> this is a fact. This is really good concrete. The concrete mix had to be accurate to a tablespoonful, and the shutters or moulds made without the smallest air hole which could cause a bubble and so spoil the wood grain pattern. All the white concrete was mixed on site and the shuttering manhandled into position. Then the cathedral rose above the city by the shovelful as the walls were poured in. The topping out ceremony on a platform a few feet from the tip of the slender spire of white concrete, a flesh rising 165 feet. And ceremonial finishing touches from the vicar general of the diocese and parish priest of the cathedral parish, Monsignor Hughes, later to meet more reporters and photographers on the ground. Gentlemen of the press, you are all very welcome, and we're very grateful to you for coming along to uh, see the project and to ask questions. It will be for the team of architects and the builder constructors to answer your technical questions. I will be prepared, or with Father Harrison, to answer any of your questions concerning why we have a cathedral at all, why it is here, why it is what it is like. The cost of the cathedral, 600,000, seems remarkably inexpensive. Do you think you've got something effective as a cathedral for that money? Oh, I think we've got something excellent. I think we've got a cathedral that is worth two million pounds. And to be quite honest, I don't know who does Lang's mathematics for them, but, um, you know, they've been extremely generous to us in uh, this £600,000 covers the cathedral and some of the works round about. And if we say a figure of £800,000 for the whole project, everything of the whole project, we are, in fact, not overestimating it. Can I ask architecturally how it was achieved? I mean, what was the chief cost saving? Yes, I think Mr. Jennett perhaps would like to answer that one. From the outset, we ha uh, worked as a team and with this cost discipline, uh, telling uh, us as the architects and the engineers uh, how we were coming out against the target cost of half a million. And I think this was achieved eventually by making the structure the finish. We actually uh, did that inside and then cleared it on the outside, really to meet uh, weathering conditions and insulation conditions. And also we cut down the openings in the structure, we reduced the things that are expensive, and the quantity of air really was a controlling influence in us being able to design down to this target, or back to the target. So I'd like to ask the architects if they have met any special problems here, and how they have overcome them. The, um, the acoustic design can't be an absolutely exact science at the initial conception. We've tried to arrange the church so that it is reverberant around the sanctuary for music, both from the organ and from the choir, and in the nave it is tuned to a lower reverberation time for the people to be able to hear what the spoken word from the ambo and from the altar. The most difficult position is probably going to be the cathedra, the bishop's chair, when he is speaking, sitting in his chair. Our actual tests on it, so far, by firing revolvers and guns and re-recording them, appear to be about right. Monsignor, can I ask a question about the design function inside, over the sanctuary, the tower? In most churches, in most buildings, the eye is led upwards, but in this tower, your eye is cut off halfway up and your eye goes down again. Why is that? We're very much down here on earth and we're trying to lift us up, and I think the flesh does and the cupola does lift us up, as I think, in fact, the, the roofs as you come in, the levels of the roofs, speak of something different going on, and there's a sort of progress up towards the Lord. In the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. His Eminence, John Cardinal Heenan, Archbishop of Westminster. This is a very happy day for us. I read this headline in the paper the other day. Bargain Cathedral to be consecrated. And underneath, the news item was that this cathedral is already known as the ecclesiastical bargain of the 1970s. 
the model has proved one of the most useful design tools that we could ever have envisaged. Its rather grubby appearance at the moment is due to the fact that it spent the last two and a half to three years on the site where the men working on the site could see the objective that they were all striving towards. It proved very useful in discussing with the client to show him in visual terms what the drawings couldn't express fully. The structural evolution with the structural engineers, the intensity of daylighting that was achieved in the building. It gave us the opportunity of being able to see the quality of daylighting by allowing the model to have two holes large enough to get our heads inside in the base. From the technical point of view, we could measure photoelectrically what we were going to achieve but we also visually could see to create the quality that we wanted. This also permitted the bishop to enter his cathedral, in a sense, two and a half years before its completion. Traditionally, Christians have sealed relics of saints within their altars. A silver box containing the cathedral's relics is brought to the bishop. The relics are set within jewels. They are fragments of bone from Pope Pius X and a scrap of cloth from a robe worn by Martyr Oliver Plunkett. got its own character and there'll be nobody coming back on this in two or three hundred years time putting things right because this is it this is it for to stay forevermore there'll be no restoration funds for this in two or three hundred years time some Christians believe the cathedral irrelevant to modern Roman Catholicism they consider the money would have been better used for houses or community centers I think we could have built a, a hut, if you like, and spent the money on something else, but we need a large church. The cathedral is by no means large in the my, in uh, Anybody who knows a cathedral wouldn't consider this a big cathedral. It is a big parish church, but it is a small cathedral. The cathedral is a focus for the religious unity of more than 100,000 Catholics within the diocese, and the first designed for everyone to see and hear what the priest does at the altar. But is the building as splendidly worthy as ancient cathedrals? The specification itself doesn't, didn't allow us to make it perfect. It could have been better had the specification uh, allowed us to make it better. Let us offer each other the sign of peace. The inspiration for the work of the church is the Eucharist, imperfect man celebrating the perfect sacrifice. The design of the cathedral, based on placing the congregation around three sides of the central altar, emphasizes a special unity, that of bishop, priests and people, as they celebrate the Mass. severe, there's nothing pretentious about it. It is in fact uh, 
I think, uh, a building that will do the city proud. The altar, focal point of the cathedral, represents Christ present among his people. And to signify its sacred purpose, the bishop anoints it with holy oil. walls of the cathedral are also anointed as a sign that the building is set apart. Festivity and joy, the twin themes of the consecration are broadcast as the cathedral is to be fully illuminated for the first time during the service. A deacon carries the paschal candle to the altar and then to the bishop's chair. lights come up and the bishop declares let the light of Christ shine throughout the church that people everywhere may come to the fullness of truth It's a cathedral, and we know it's a cathedral. But as a building, no. I ought to tell you, perhaps, I, I thought it was awful at first, but I now have been converted. I think it's a very good building indeed. So the concrete lantern of the new cathedral is made to shine. Warm candlelight falls upon the white concrete walls, blanketed against the cold by polystyrene, and wrapped against the weather outside by pink slabs of Aberdeen granite. The constancy of stone is a quality of faith.